Hello everybody, this is your host Nino and I invite you very kindly to our second installment of exploring Android 404 on the ASUS EEE PC 701. In our first part we were looking at the general setup as well as the general usage of Alpine Linux on the device in order to extend its capabilities. We were looking at starting various programs. We were looking in particular into the issue of web browsing. And in today's episode, we shall venture further and explore more eccentric possibilities of reaching our goals and seeing how far we come. So join me in this little journey and I truly hope you enjoy it. So I was trying to figure out what makes my Alpine installation so very slow when trying to run either Firefox or Midori and even letting Dillo appear unusually slow. And then it dawned on me that likely there are mechanisms of so-called unloading at work. This is a last resort of the Linux kernel to still execute a program for which there is not enough memory, and it is only resorted to after virtual memory has been exhausted. The idea being that the computer's memory is used just as a sort of large cage into which only those fragments of the program are repeatedly loaded, which are scheduled for immediate execution. And thereby the kernel, so to say, crawls along your program and tries to still execute it. This thing is not exactly something very stable, certainly something prone to crashing due to the large delays in doing so, and so on and so forth. Basically, a uh, terrible thing to do. So, looking at things, I discovered there isn't any virtual memory used. So, if we say free then, you know, zero swap. And I was thinking, well, let's change that. It can't be that difficult to, to make a little swap partition, right? So, you know, you do swap just this way that you are uh, creating with DD first an empty file here just for the sake of speed with 10 megabyte. Then you're saying make swap so you're formatting the swap file this is just like make x2 just in this case it's making swap so now we have a file that has been formatted as a swap file and the last thing you need to do is to say swap on swap file however this is android and the kernel has not been compiled to be able to use a swap file which I find somewhat ironic given that both the free command gives you a line about swap and there is an mkswap command. So why would you be having that command if you don't have um, the opportunity to use swap? Okay, but this is a bit beyond me. I'm not exactly sure why, but all in all, there is no swap usable on Android. Well, that means no normal virtual memory for our browsers, right? And in that regard, I tried to do something else. I thought, if this Linux kernel cannot use swap, why don't I just get one that can? And for that purpose, I decided to create a virtual machine. Indeed, running again Alpine Linux. So that means Alpine Linux running through an emulator on Alpine Linux, but the emulated one not having the swap restriction in the kernel. And that installation should in theory have been able to procure me virtual memory through swapping and thereby perhaps a more bearable browsing experience. But unfortunately, <laughs> the browsing experience became even less bearable. I went ahead and created a virtual machine in Camu, you know, the famous emulator. So I installed Camu in Alpine Linux over here. On my main laptop, I prepared the virtual machine and I transferred it here. And now you'll see why 
fundamentally this became unusable. So here I am creating a virtual machine and I'm giving it 400 megabytes of RAM. So I'm just keeping some about 100 megabytes for the Android system and the CH root here. I'm giving really the vast majority to my camo system. And as I do so, I'm going to see the system actually through VNC and I can thereby turn on my VNC client and watch it booting. And that is just what we will be doing now and you will see why this is not something we can truly make use of. So here is the VNC viewer. And here you see basically two things, yeah? The local connection, which is what we will be looking at now. And uh, another connection to the system itself where it's basically not Camus VNC server, but the VNC server from the new Alpine installation. I was not aware that Camus will be giving me a VNC server in the first place, so this is why actually I set up such a thing. I call it Inception because I thought this reminds me of that movie with Cillian Murphy and Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, with this dream within a dream thing. You're having a Linux installation within a Linux installation. And that's what we are trying to look at. But let's make just first a simple local connection to watch it booting. Yeah, that is what it looks like. And let me tell you something. That is what it will be looking like for the next at least 10 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes is the time this needs to boot. Normally around 12. So <laughs> I'm not sure you want to wait that long. And I shall rather venture to assume you don't. But let's have a look at one thing. This is our client where we started it, our terminal client. And we're having now, as you can see, 2.38 p.m. So let's see how long will it take until we actually see an image of a sort of booted system on our VNC client. And in conclusion, I mean, you can already imagine that, that speed is even way more glacial than what we saw in the immediate CH root installation anyway. And while it is entirely possible to use virtual memory through this trick it is not practically feasible because it simply takes absolutely forever. The Alpine Linux Camo installation on my main laptop was booting in about two or three seconds, tops. And here, well, let's see when something is happening here. Look, it began showing something. Anything at all. Even more is shown. This normally flashes past our eyes too fast to read. But here we can explore every detail of the system booting. Show us something more. Come on. And again we wait. The font has just been changed, so that means the video drivers have been loaded. And once more, we wait. Line by line, the booting process continues, but it is not fast at all. The boot is creeping forward. File systems are being remounted. Swap devices are being activated. I created in this system a little bit of swap on my own, though it had apparently created a one gigabyte swap partition anyway. We are relentlessly marching towards login. Let's see. 
networking devices are getting activated. ETH0. A DHCP lease has been received. We have the IP address of 10.02.15. Syslog and the Chrome daemon have started. You just saw the SSH server light up. If you are ever curious what it looks like in detail when a Linux system is booting, I can only recommend you watching that camo boot screen. Everything is easily and clearly visible as it simply takes forever. And finally, the login prompt appeared. So, how long did we need? Let's go back to our VNC viewer. I oh, know, that's where we are. Let's go to our terminal. And we can see here, it is 2.49, at 3.38, at 2.38 we started the whole thing. So it has taken us, yeah, you see now it just became 50, about 12 minutes to even boot into that system. All right, we actually will not need this any longer. We can now, in fact, connect to the VNC server from inside Alpine which has been started for our comfort. It is asking now for the password. Huh. All right, it seems that it has not started just yet, but let's give it a moment. And there we are, everybody. This is GWM, the Java window manager. <laughs> which is actually an absolutely minuscule thingy, which is normally extremely efficient. And that is what we could be using in order to run our Firefox application. We just need to go here to say terminal. Yep. Having a terminal is so comfortable if you want to kill something in the background. I'm not sure it took it. I'm not sure it's going to execute it. So let's move the arrow onto terminal. Let's click on terminal. I am clicking, but nothing is happening. I can get here a mouse for greater visibility and click that. Nonetheless, nothing at all is happening. So, all right. Maybe I should just go for it. Maybe I should just go for starting Firefox. Ah, no, finally it reacted. Finally, we're going to have a terminal. Let's see how long it takes until that starts. Habimus terminal. Okay, so finally we got a terminal, but what's the time? Like seriously? Ah, we're having now 12.55. So we are nearly 20 minutes into having booted that system that we finally have a terminal. I'm even afraid to think what will happen if I'm going to try to start Firefox. I'm not even sure this will work. Now, before I do that, Let's look at our memory. VMstat. Not sure this is even installed. No, but then let's just try free. All right. So, <laughs> swap has not yet been used, but there's one and a half gigabytes of it. Free memory, however, is allegedly 300 megabyte. All right, let's give uh, Firefox a spin. And let's mark the time at 2.56, we're starting Firefox. We are having some sort of 
Firefox launch screen. Let's see at what time. At 2.59. Firefox is not appearing yet, but a little bit of background writing we are getting, right? And at 3.11, we're getting the message that the network connection has been lost. So, apparently, the entire affair crashed anyway. And with this, I believe, it can be concluded. I mean, I can try to log in again. Ah, port could not be contacted. I think with this, it can be concluded that tricking our way around the virtual memory limitation is not truly an option. Apparently, Android killed Alpine due to having used up all the available memory. Perhaps I could start Kemu another time, this time with less memory. But how is going to be using less real memory going to be helpful in the speed of starting Firefox in any way? I don't see that. So with this, I conclude taking our way around the virtual memory limitation in order to gain speed is a no-go. And so we are stuck with the browsers available to us within Android and within the ch root environment of Alpine. But there is yet another possibility which we shall explore just in a moment. Now, let me show you perhaps something slightly non-obvious. So this is the netbook, while it is, so to say, in power saving mode or slightly asleep. And I don't know whether you can actually see here my mouse cursor. It is right now on the lock. If I now try to unlock it, the user interface is not reacting. And when you face that the first time, it's rather puzzling. All you have to do is just to press the button, then it lights up, and then it will react and allow you to actually unlock it. Now, taking an entirely different angle than the ch root approach, do you remember jar files or J2ME middlets? Anyway, those Java Micro Edition applications, which once upon a time could be loaded onto phones capable of executing them, in order to provide such phones with extra programs and functionality which they natively did not have. So these little programs used to be everywhere and to fulfill much the same purpose as nowadays you find in applications from Play Store, App Store, whatever else these stores are all called. Well, the interesting news is JAR files or GA2ME middlets are still around. In particular, I found a lot of them on a Pakistani site called Foneki. And I do tell you, jar files were the Wild West and still are. As opposed to civilized apps as you are nowadays perhaps used from Android and iPhone, there were no specific design guidelines or other quality criteria which were somehow universally established. But instead, everybody programmed his or her own thing, tried his or her own payment system, and so on and so forth. And in many regards, jar files were pure chaos and a hit and miss whether they would be working or not. Android, indeed, has had always programs to run jar files. Once upon a time, the famous ones were JBAD and NetMite. But neither of those work on Android x86. What does work, however, is something called J2ME Loader. And here you can see its icon perhaps a little more clearly. And that program is allowing you to run 
middlets on Android. You need to go to a website, find them, download them, and then open them with J2ME Loader, and it is going to apparently somewhat transform them into a form runnable by Android. Evidently, that is not a hard science, and it is more of a hit and miss. So from the around 200 something apps I got from Foneki and filtering out the ones which were obvious spam or scam attempts, there were around 50, that is about 1 in 5, 1 in 4, 1 in 5, yeah, it was like 200, 260 maybe apps I got, which were in the end truly working. Now that's actually quite a fun experience in itself to filter out which ones are working because the scam sites which were commonly referenced simply did not open in the browser anymore. No contact could even be established to scam me. So what have we got here? All sorts of things. And some are better, some are worse. But anyway, I have turned this Android 404 machine into a Java Midlet treasure trove. So I have here something for sort of everything. I have notepads, book readers, even a paint program or two. <laughs> and I can all run them from the J2ME loader. And perhaps I should demonstrate a couple to you. So now, looking at the Java midlets. Well, this Ablume, <laughs> I have no idea what that is. And I have no idea what it does. I have just left it here in order to explore it later on. Then we are having apparently some Adobe Reader. And it seemed to be not too bad. I was generally able to, to get some simpler PDFs open through it. What was particularly of interest to me though was this Bantam Paint Plus program. And here you see what generally things look like when you start them with the J2ME uh, emulator. So you're having basically your phone in the middle and some control surfaces at the side. What you should pay attention to is that when you install a program, it asks you what resolution to give it, and it is proposing 328 by 240 wide. I advise you to stick with that. Of course, you could make the whole thing work on a larger screen, but as this were not commonly resolution sizes available at the time when Java midlets were in their heyday, many programs simply crash or do not work properly if you give them a too large screen size. So if you work with the J2ME loader, get used to that resolution if you want things to work sort of properly. But now I got a pretty decent paint program. You know, it is said that Caravaggio was asked by the Pope to prove his art. And he took a piece of paper and a pencil and drew a perfect circle without any help. And that greatly impressed the Pope. I know what, what Caravaggio can do, we can see here just as well, right? I, I am certain the Pope would have been absolutely impressed by this ideal circle. And now let's better not talk about that any further. But anyway, I got a pro paint program, and that was at the time before I even found a proper Android paint program. So, <laughs> I I'm not unhappy. I find it actually rather nice. There was a more advanced version of it where you could save that in a particular folder, but that unfortunately was crashing. However, the simpler midlet is working indeed. Then, if we are looking on... There are a couple of network-related programs here, like, for instance, the Bolt browser. But when you open most of those network-related browsers, they are not able to reach the Internet. Here you see I have made that have a bigger screen. I was really hoping that I will get anywhere 
but unfortunately the network is not being detected so the bold browser is unusable. That does not mean that it wouldn't be usable on a phone, likely there it would work. But the J2ME loader apparently has this limitation that most apps, though not all, but most, are not able to detect the internet connection. Then we are having here various calculators and book readers and whatnot. So if you want to see what a calculator would look like, you see this is an actually rather decent scientific calculator. And if I would say, I don't know, 2 and then sinus. So the sinus of 2 is 0 0.909. Yeah, that's actually correct. So yeah, you have this. And you need to operate it really like a phone keyboard. So if one were to write with letters, one really has to click here multiple times on these numbers in order to create letters. This is the left button of the phone, this is the right button of the phone, and down here you see what they do. So the left one could change the theme, and the right button is giving us a menu from which we can exit. The exit, though, you can then press with your cursor. So, I got a dictionary. <laughs> Oopsie daisy, so the dictionary does not seem to be working right now, which is a little bit of a pity because it used to work and it was rather nice. And maybe I can reinstall it. Install. But that is something which does happen with Java applets. And what is really interesting is it used to happen at the time as well. I very well remember that Sometimes such issues could happen also on real phones. Okay, so let's try again to start it. No guarantees. And no, well, it looks like I just lost an applet. I'll see into it later on. But they can indeed reach a stage where they are unfixable and where you really need to just uh, obtain again the jar file, reinstall them or completely delete them. But the next one is fun. By Hors d'oeuvre. Yeah, yeah, what a name. Well, basically, that is a sort of MS-DOS-like thing. Oh, that's really lovely, isn't it? And you can, for instance, type dir but you have to type it, as I say, as on a phone. And I believe then it was with fire. Yeah. <laughs> so you see, actually, here this high dot C, this is, this is in the mount slash SD card directory of my uh, Android system. So it is showing me my Android system correctly. And I am rather positively impressed by that. Well, on we go then. Now, the next one I would like to show you is called JJ Oz, which is again such a sort of pseudo CLI interface for your mobile phone at the time. Now, as opposed to terminals, as you have seen them in Android or in, on iOS, which do give you some form of connection to the real system, these are really just self-contained apps. They don't do anything in particular. Like, you don't actually get to exit to the real world with them. So this is just showing a command line, not because the system has one, but because it is made to show a command line. It is made to show a textual interface. So if I now press help here, I see the various commands. I see there is one which is called JJOS. I'm wondering what that one might be doing. Oopsie daisy. Uh, I think left was backspace, yes. So let's just try and see, right? This is, this is how you do things here. And often enough, stuff is crashing, nothing is working, and so on. So if I say JJOS... Oh, that is giving us a tutorial. Well, that's great. Okay, so... Have fun around JJOS. Well, we will certainly try. 
and apparently you can script here and create variables and whatnot. So yeah, DROS and JJOS were actually two really funny thingies which one might play around with if having to resort to midlets. And I am trying to find where the X is, and I'm not exactly sure. Okay, exit, and off we go. One, yes, we're sure. Now comes perhaps the most impressive application I have. Namely, a program to program programs on an ancient phone. So that is indeed a Java midlet which is allowing you, as you can see up here, to navigate around and create new Java projects and write programs which would then be turned on your phone into jar files. So that is really like a compiler on, on a desktop machine or similar to, to, anyway, serious application development. I read even a story of a very smart Nigerian boy whose first environment of programming anything has been exactly that thing and he has been programming stuff in that professionally before he 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 got means to to get a more proper development installation anyway i'm highly impressed of course also by the boy but most definitely also by the piece of software itself it was also the most um, capable text editor so far as it was the only application in which i was able to write any carriage return like unfortunately everything else was uh, let's say new project okay yeah whatever then let's say create Ah, folder already exists. Okay, then, then maybe... Maybe something else. Let's call it just one N less. And let's say create. And then some, I don't know, resources or source packages. Okay, open. Okay, menu and menu. Whoopsie daisy, no, menu. And I can now create whatever or write something and, and whatnot. So I haven't yet explored it. I just relatively freshly got my fingers onto it. But it seems to be something which no other jar has offered so far. So if you would like to try programming something on it, I do invite you to try the J2ME SDK mobile. When you're looking for J2ME SDK, that's how you'll find it for sure. So I'm just going to exit now though and continue showing you a little, a couple of interesting things. So there is something called Microsoft Word. This is really terrible and certainly it's not from Microsoft. <laughs> it's a sort of text editor which crashed on me a couple of times. Yeah, I would like to edit now something. Can, can I do so? So what if I write hello? Hello. So you can see, I could write here a wonderful novel, just writing with the help of this thing. I'm not exactly sure how to do this. Ah, maybe here I'm having, no, I'm not. Oh, where is the carriage return? Is there a carriage return? Things we will never know. Okay, maybe I should clear a couple of these things. Maybe I should press fire. Maybe I should press down arrow. Maybe I should go to the menu. Maybe I should do something here. I'm not entirely even sure what. If I press the right arrow, I arrive at some E thing. I click edit. And again, I am in this absolutely amazing editor menu. So, yeah. Everybody, if you ever get... ah. See, it produced finally the carriage returns. Yeah, it does that sometimes. Anyway, so that is how you can edit something here on the so-called Microsoft Word. But you will understand why I, why I might be all too happy to leave it. Do we want to delete our wonderful document? Yes, absolutely. How does one leave this? I'm not entirely sure. So, ref pressing, no. 
are right pressing and fire. Yes, delete. Really, delete. This is what middlets are doing to me. Can say back. Again, I can say edit and, and nothing happens. Uh, all in all, I am not at all sure how to leave. This is really like Hotel California. I'm going to leave the harsh way with exit. Yeah, the warning that I might crash the poor middle it, I just did. Now comes something more interesting. Lisp on J2ME. Now, the fun part about the Lisp systems is I've got here two by some person named Hiroshi Gomi. Lisp 2 doesn't seem to work. I'm not really able to get that to run. But I'm going to show you Lisp 1, which apparently does work. The interface is Japanese, and no, I don't know Japanese, but that certainly won't stop me. So I can say here something like, oopsie daisy, cons A and B. And I figured out that if I press down here left, it's going to be evaluated into A dot B, right? And I can say I want to defun define a function with defun. Defun PL for like plus. Okay, and I believe this was the left brace. Yes. Defun PL of X. Okay. Shall we simply adding 1 to x plus plus 1x? All right. So I'm saying evaluate that. And it told me it got pl. And now if I try pl of 4, it is going to give me 5, which is sort of very lovely, but... I'm not sure that I can have conditions. So that was a problem on my cell phone at the time and I never figured out whether it was due to the phone or due to the Lisp interpreter. So join me now in figuring this finally out once and for all. We're going to say cond for condition greater if 2 is greater than 3 then give us nil that is nothing or otherwise give us true and clicking here and executing it undefined function cond so I don't actually have a condition system not in the classical way I mean, I can try with if and evaluate it. Whoopsie daisy. Uh, how was that working? Yeah, one, one couple of braces less exactly. So, okay. So if two is greater than three, then nil, otherwise true. Undefined function. I can try with greater p. So we don't have that either. Okay, let's try something ridiculous. Let's say if nil is empty, which definitely is and so forth. I actually don't see how I can execute here any condition. So while it is sort of lovely, without conditions, a Lisp system isn't really going anywhere. Again, that is what middlets are like. Although I'm very, very impressed and it's the only time I have ever seen anyone implementing anything like a Lisp system in a J2MA middlet. Now this one is an absolute favorite of mine, the Mini Commander. This is basically the Norton Commander just for middlets. <laughs> so here I can go to somewhere and then, yeah, <laughs> I can, yeah, let's move right. 
Oops, how, how do I move right? I'm not even sure. Is it perhaps that I press right or... Ah, so you see, I can actually have here also various um, options, including one for connections. So I can make apparently an FTP connection to somewhere and upload and download files as well as having some Bluetooth connection. But instead of it, I might actually go for the exit <laughs> rather than for anything else. Let's see. Um, or not. I pressed the right button in the hope of staying in there, but that did not quite work out. So, then we are having something which is called Mini Excel. And it is exactly as you would imagine, something very much like the Mini Word. But, depending on what you're dealing with, sometimes these spreadsheets are working and sometimes not. Let's try this one out. So, I want to say that... Uh -oh, I wanted to say that there is three, but apparently... That's not so easy. Now if I press here the cell, apparently I can add something. So let's put in here 33. Okay, that's excellent. And in the other cell, let's put 26. Okay, so we're having here 33 and 26. And in the third cell, I shall be adding a 1 and a2. And it is giving me 59. So what do you need Excel for? What would you need LibreOffice Calc or Numeric for if you have something all so amazing as uh, <laughs> this variant of Excel? Which we shall now quit. Quit without saving? Oh yes and exit. But nonetheless, I was very fond of those spreadsheet thingies, you know. Now, it was also exceptionally hard to find here a working basic interpreter. Indeed, I did not find easily one for Android itself, and from the three I knew as Java applets, and of which I normally pick something called cellular basic, here this time, Mobile Basic seemed to be the only one truly working. So that is told that it is a trial version and whatnot. But it is working nonetheless. And if I say... Uh, <laughs> oh god, no, this was this was terrible. So... If I say whatever was it, he was the... No, he was bigger and smaller. Yeah, his backspace, exactly. I had to use... Again, the keyboard here in order to program anything. So, if I now say print and then again, no, oh, space, I want space, yes. Print and then let's say, I don't know, 79, okay, whoopsie. Um, mm -hmm. No, I don't want that. Can I turn it maybe into letters somehow? Into numbers? Okay, I have to figure out yet how do I get to numbers from the letters because so far I only see how to be writing letters. Nonetheless... Okay, you know what? I'm going to leave it at Q, and I'm going to print Q. And Q should be zero, because I haven't initialized it to anything. So, once I creep forward sufficiently, I will simply go now for carriage return and 0, 0.0. So, in general, this is working, but on this keyboard, I haven't figured out yet how to switch to numbers. Gosh, that must be possible. Like, this is ridiculous. Okay, let's just exit it. Exit it. Yes. Anyway, that's the best I can do. This is what Java applets are like. Each one of them a little idiosyncratic. Each one of them letting you do things in a somewhat different way. We were having here the mobile notepad. Now that was pretty nice. I could add a note here. Right, I could say select. 
and then I could call it something like my note. Okay. And then I could write hello there. But what I cannot do is press enter. So when I press enter, I just get to home. I can click here on show notes, select, and I see my test, which I can again select. Ha, <laughs> yeah, that is a previous no note. Okay, it's impossible to break the lines. So add a note, select, hi, title hi, okay, and then I write hi, and then I say add note, so home, and then I say show notes, I say select, I have high, I say select, and there is my high. Okay, so you can write notes on that thing, and you're not entirely desperate as you are able to find them later on the file system. Now, there are countless note-taking programs here of a very similar style. What was also nice, by the way, as a file manager, it was this Mobi Explorer. And that was also rather decent and, and you could navigate it quite the way you would be normally used to, right? Quite the way a file browser normally would work. But I'm not sure how did that work. Actions. What, what actions? My man, I just made an advertisement of you and now you are just being ridiculous, huh? Uh, okay, now cancel. So fire is not working. Left select is not working. Mobi Explorer. About. Yeah. Doesn't do a thing. If I go up into Android, if I press fire or down or right. I don't know. I'm not even sure that I went anywhere. Pressing back, it does not work. Gosh, is this terrible. Okay, I guess I'll just leave this and I take back the advertisement I just made. <laughs> Forget the mobile, Mobi Explorer. Anyway, let's go on to the periodic table. Now, this was nice because I could see a little bit chemical elements, though you have to navigate particularly here through through the asterisk and double asterisk in order to uh, oops in order to visit the corresponding chemical elements. Yeah, when I press fire I get to the lanthanids or when I now press fire I get to the actinids and if you want to Look at uranium, perhaps. That's what it looks like. Yeah, not much uranium-235. You need to have a decent program to get anything out of it, right? Ask North Korea, they can tell you a little bit <laughs> about it. So, now, let's get out of here. But anyway, that is sort of the quality you can expect. Then there was something which was called QQ Browser Mini, which looked also rather decent... But once again, I'm not actually able to reach the internet. So despite the fact that I have here websites, if I now click on the BBC, for instance, and I go forward, then it's not actually going to get anywhere. Unfortunately, it can't connect to the real internet. So, and so on it goes and on and on for all sorts of things. Uh, I have a stopwatch, I have all sorts of book readers, some of them able to read PDFs, others just text. But in the end, there was one program that was very interesting to me, the UC browser. Truly, the Chinese have created here a masterpiece that, opposed to most other programs, is able to detect the internet, and I can go and surf with this program. So let's go to Wiener Zeitung. This is a most unusual thing which nobody in China will be visiting, I assume. So I press OK. It is connected. An error has occurred. Yes, reload. 
Okay, and we have some issue with Wiener Zeitung. Okay, let's go to the BBC. Hmm. But the BBC does in fact work. So I am getting a web page and thereby I have a more modern browser that is actually graphically working on Android 404 on an Asus EEE PC from once upon a time. Who would have thought that our savior in this most difficult moment will be a program for a most primitive platform? And with that, now you see how you can graphically browse the internet on Android over here. And I believe that this is actually also <laughs> the maybe one biggest reason for you to get to get the J2ME loader program. And with that, I believe we have sufficiently explored the possibilities with Java applets are offering us. And perhaps before we say goodbye, we should explore one further way of using this netbook. One very old-fashioned way. Ultimately, whether you deem a computer system satisfactory will be very much determined by the question of whether it allows you to creatively pursue your goals. And in the 1970s, with the Control Program and Monitor, or CPM, arguably there was a time where that was possible quite distraction-free. And indeed, I compiled J. H. Allen's CPM emulator, which you'll find on GitHub if you look for it, and it does work amazingly on this EEPC 701. So if I just run it here, I'm greeted by the familiar A prompt. And if I now say dear, <laughs> I see pretty much what I saw above, just in, in the more classical old-fashioned way. And here I can indeed run, for instance, Microsoft Basic. Just if you try to do that, I give you the advice, make everything lowercase, for the emulator seems to have some issue with uppercase programs. I can run none of these, but I copied the one I was interested in into its lowercase version. At first, let's try mBasic. So that's a basic by Microsoft. As you can see, I have some 30 kilobyte free, and this is really as it would be at the time. So 10 for i is equal to one, two, 10, 20, print i times i times i. Let's look at the cubic numbers, 30 next i. For, and then simply, oh yes, backspace is great. This is the classical CPM way of doing a backspace. You're writing a, sl a backslash and then you're writing again the character which you deleted. So if I now say run, there you have it. Everything is working marvelously. So I can then just say system, for that was how one was leaving that interpreter. And back I am under the A prompt. I can run the MuLisp system, a miniature Lisp system of very capable quality. I can load the utility library, but ah, I have to work here in uppercase. The system accepts only uppercase characters. Utility lib without a dot. Yeah, that is how it was. And now I got all sorts of functions which I otherwise would not have. So if I say, factorial of 5, I'm getting 120. So you see, this is working just nicely. So I'm basically having here a very nice distraction-free CPM system on which I can load all sorts of CPM programs and enjoy the world as it was some 40, 50 years ago. What I, however, particularly have grown to like is Miguel's text editor, Miguel Viz Garcia. You are a brilliant programmer and I'm very grateful. 
So <laughs> that is a very nice graphical text editor, which demands from you no knowledge of a million of key combinations, as was, however, common at the time for all sorts of text editors available then. And I'm talking here of key combinations which nobody really remembers today. So, hey there. Okay, and I can make carriage returns. Oopsie, control H returns on CPM. Excellent. And now, if I want to save that, I just say escape and then I can say save as. As you can see, here's always that letter capitalized, which you're supposed to use. So I'm saying A and then it's asking me here down here for the file name. And I'm going to say hi text. And it rolled it, and if I go to the menu again with escape and press X, I'm back at the A prompt. And if I now say type high text, the thing we just wrote, I have my text. So that, everybody, is CPM on the EEPC. And if you ask me which is truly the best operating system, to run on this sort of retro gadget, which really looks as if it freshly escaped the 1970s with its broad bezel and uh, white and black color scheme, then without doubt I will propose this is CPM. So, thank you very much for watching, hope to greet you here soon again. Have a great day, and from me, goodbye. And shut down. Control Alt F1 and reboot dash P for power off.